traditional approach within microfinance industry, and I think other industries as well, is what I rudely call bathtub product development. And this is where the CEO sits in the bath and has a, a brainstorm and goes, ah, I know what we'll do. We'll offer the clients this product. And he gets out of the bath and next day he types a memo out that goes to all the branches, we're offering this new product. No one's tested it with the clients. No one's worried about the institutional implications of it, and it's very damaging quite often. And we've, we've walked into so many organizations that have sort of debris of legacy products, which were sort of rolled out in this way, didn't work properly, and they're now trying to be rolled back. And actually rolling back a, a product that you've tried to push out to the market that is not right, either for the clients or for the institution, is actually very costly and damaging also to the reputation of the, the institution itself. There is always this tension and trade-off between the simplicity of the product for the organization and the effectiveness for the, the customer. So, you know, uh, for most microfinance organizations, weekly repayment is um, in part to respond to a client's need to break down the repayment into small manageable pieces. But also, very often, it's about, it keeps it simple for us, the financial institution. Because poor people's cash flows vary significantly over the year. Um, so they may actually need a, a more complex product. The, the issue in some respects is twofold. One, the trade-off between simplicity for the institution and the ability to communicate those products effectively. So there's real benefit in simplicity when it comes to communicating the product and managing the product. But oversimplified products can mean that you put a client in a, in a sta straight jacket. And I think one of the challenges for those of us that are interested in financial inclusion is to, one, optimize the, um, the use of technology to deliver rather more sophisticated products um, but at the same time, help our staff to communicate those in a way that is understandable to clients. Mobile money has the potential to completely revolutionize financial inclusion. There's absolutely no question about it. It surprises me in a lot of the mainstream traditional microfinance industry how little this is discussed. I mean, you know, at the moment it may be a small light at the end of a big black tunnel, but that is a train coming at us. And the sooner we, you know, think about how we're going to manage that and use it effectively for the benefit of clients, the better. Now, you know, we do a lot of work in Kenya, we do a lot of work with mobile money, and we're all struggling with it, realistically speaking, on two levels. First of all, the vast majority of cases that we go to where we've been asked to do product design for delivery on mobile platforms, we go out and look at the agent networks and they're simply not functioning well enough to support product development or the delivery of products across that platform. The second thing is that I think in the enthusiasm and love affair with M-Pesa, we're forgetting that it is only uh, a payment system and a, quite an expensive one too. So if you look at the average behavior on M-Pesa, it, it's used by the, by the people who are enrolled on M-Pesa maybe twice a month. Now that twice a month of a payment is not financial inclusion. Financial inclusion involves us having offering the poor a range of appropriate products. Savings, credit, definitely payment. It's very important. Payments play a very important role. Um, but they need that range. The nightmare scenario, of course, is that we, we get mobile money wrong. And um, there is a risk of this. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's proved to be a lot more difficult than we had all hoped. Um, I, was, I was privileged enough to sit on the steering committee of M-Pesa, and, you know, we thought it was going to be, you know, more complicated than it was in Kenya, frankly speaking. And so everyone looked at Kenya and M-Pesa land and thought, this is the future, we just copy M-Pesa. And of course, it's proved terribly much more complicated and difficult than that because not every economy, not every society is Kenya. And frankly, not every regulatory regime is Kenya either. Um, so now we've really got to go back to the basics, uh, understand the client, build the network, agent network and the distribution channels effectively, and so on. So. It's a longer haul and a, a more of a struggle than we had anticipated. But I still would like to believe 
that we'll get to the, the positive scenario and, and not find ourselves just left with wonderful payment systems but not daily relevant to poor people. To realise the potential that is offered by mobile money, microfinance organisations will have to rethink the way they do business. Um, but they offer tremendous opportunity. We've just talked about how agent networks are in the main poorly managed. Microfinance organisations could potentially provide the solution to that. They're used to reaching out into remote areas. They're used to managing liquidity, which is one of the big challenges. They're used to strong internal controls and systems to ensure quality and um, reduce, if not eliminate, fraud. So they're really perfect candidates to be agent network. And that would also give them a very important opportunity, which would be to take the loan capital off their balance sheets. Because if they're agents, they can not only offer the clients a broader range of services on behalf of the banks, but they also don't need to worry about lending their own money. They lend the bank's money to the clients and then collect commission on it. And, uh, you know, it just, it, it appears to me, it's a significant uh, gear shift, but a tremendous opportunity. In some respects, I think Occupy Wall Street and, and the, the rage against the, the bankers re-emphasizes the importance of financial inclusion with a human face. Um, you know, again, our obsession at Microsave is to put the client at the center of the business. It makes sense from a business point of view. It makes sense from a development point of view as well. If I'm delivering the sort of products that clients find useful, that are designed to respond to their needs, then I'm providing a valuable service. Um, so, I mean, I think that really the current feelings around the Occupy movements and so on are reflective of some, on some level, of the whole crisis of microfinance. But at the same time, realistically speaking, it further strengthens the case for financial inclusion. Because what we're talking about is not exclusive banking that serves a few bankers, but large-scale mass banking that serves all of us and supports the development of an economy. The best case scenario, I think, is in 10 years' time, we've figured out how to harness the potential of mobile money to massify financial inclusion at much lower cost. And that will involve much more digital money and a lot less cash. Because the moment cash comes into the equation, it becomes expensive to manage. Um, so there are a whole load of advantages of trying to get as much throughput with government to person payments, to uh, salary payments, all these sort of things to be made in digital money. And then also to find other ways, pull factors, to keep it in digital money so that I pay my rent, I pay my school fees, I pay my utilities, I pay large proportion of my bills, my outgoings, my expenses in digital finance. If we can do that, then we can make the whole process of economic activity a lot smoother and therefore the multiplier effect will, will be significantly enhanced. So that would be the dream that you know, billions of people have access to mobile money, a range of mobile money enabled services that allow them to operate their finances in a much more effective way.